It's 7 p.m. Friday, June 28th, here in Seoul. Coming up on New Center tonight. The G20 summit officially kicks off in Japan. President Moon Jae-in holds talks with the leaders of India, Indonesia and France, agreeing to boost economic ties and work together for peace. He'll meet Russian President Vladimir Putin in the coming hours. President Moon calls on G20 nations to lead the way towards what he calls expanded balance through free trade. He also urges concerted efforts to overcome the fallout from trade conflicts. Washington's top nuclear envoy Stephen Began says the U.S. is ready to engage in talks with North Korea. His remark comes as he sets the stage for President Donald Trump's upcoming visit to South Korea for a summit with President Moon. And with the summer vacation season nearly upon us, many Koreans seem to be opting for domestic travel rather than going overseas. New Center begins now. Good evening and welcome to Arirang News Centre, coming to you live from Seoul. I'm Noa Ram. And I'm Han Dan. Thanks for joining us. We'll begin with a G20 summit in Japan, where South Korean President Moon Jae-in is holding a series of one-on-ones with global leaders. He still has one major summit left on his schedule today, and that is with his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin. For more details, let's connect to our Shin Semin, who joins us from Osaka. Semin. What's on the agenda for the upcoming Moon-Putin talks? And could there be a last-minute summit between the leaders of South Korea and Japan? Right, it's one of the most important meetings for President Moon during this G20 summit period here in Japan, along with the Chinese President's uh, Xi Jinping summit that took place just yesterday. Now, in less than four hours' time, both leaders Moon and Putin will be back in the room again to discuss the latest developments happening on the Korean Peninsula in terms of the denuclearization process and how that is shaping up. For one, we could also expect that President Moon may receive a message of some sort from President Putin after after the uh, Russian president had held a summit meeting with North Korea's Kim Jong-un back in April in Vladivostok. Now, uh, shortly after that meeting in Vladivostok, President Putin called for a multilateral talks on the denuclearization process of the Korean Peninsula. And South Korea's presidential office, however, stands firm that the most important discussions should be made between the actual parties, North Korea and the U.S., and that any progress on the nuclear talks comes from a meeting between Kim and Trump as well. Also during the meeting tonight, President Moon may also call on Russia to help speed up the nuclear negotiations. And just to brush you up on Moscow's stance, the Russian president most recently in an interview with Financial Times had expressed that rather than just discussing denuclearization, the parties involved need to discuss how to ensure the unconditional security of North Korea. And as for the possibility of a summit between Moon and Japan's Jap- Japanese leader Shinzo Abe, a meeting still seems unlikely at this point. But given that Japan is the host nation of this year's G20, the last-minute adjustment may take place. And with President Moon having already said that he's always ready to hold summit with, uh, with Japan's uh, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, we shall also keep an eye on that latest development happening. That's all for me at this hour, but I'll be sure to keep an eye on more developments happening in the coming hours. Our chief political correspondent Shin Semin in Osaka for us. Semin, thank you. Also at the G20, President Moon Jae-in has called for member nations to work together on addressing challenges facing the global economy. He emphasized the need to resolve a trade conflict and stabilize financial markets. Our Park Hee-jun in Osaka tonight with more. President Moon Jae-in has called on the G20 to step up their efforts in countering the unwanted side effects of the raging U.S.-China trade war. He said this at a G20 session on the global economy, trade and investment on Friday. The global trade dispute dominated the discussions as the meeting came at a time when the international community struggles to find answers to growing economic uncertainties caused by the trade conflict. The expansion of trade wars and trade protectionism has also led the IMF and OECD to lower their economic growth forecasts for the global economy. According to the South Korean president, only the G20 can resolve the current economic challenges. 
calling for active fiscal policies. He says it's crucial to strengthen global financial safety nets to respond to market uncertainties. He added that the IMF needs to acquire sufficient loan capacities to minimize the damage when risk escalates, and each country needs to help stabilize the financial market by better managing the foreign exchange market. President Moon also called for joint efforts from the G20 and World Trade Organization reform, which he says is a must for fair and free trade practices. Also at the session, President Moon shared his government's efforts to create a people-centered and inclusive economy. He said that as a result of related policies during his first two years in office, South Korea was able to achieve a gross national income of 30,000 U.S. dollars a year and launched the world's first 5G network. The trade war has once again been in the spotlight at this year's G20. The economic uncertainties that lie ahead are hard to predict. But President Moon says with confidence that they can be overcome with joint efforts among the G20 nations. Park Hee-jun, Arirang News, Osaka. Staying with the G20 summit, earlier in the day, President Moon asked for the Indian Prime Minister's support for Korean firms looking to clinch partnerships with India's arms industry. At the sidelines of the G20 session, the two leaders discussed regional security and expanding cooperation and agreed to create synergy between Moon's new southern policy and New Delhi's Act East policy. Also today, in a meeting with Indonesian President Joko Widodo, President Moon expressed hopes of striking a trade deal with the East Asian nation by November. Moon also said Seoul is an optimal partner in Indonesia's infrastructure and construction, to which the President Widodo responded by saying he appreciates Seoul's push to improve ties with the country. Also, in a brief one-on-one -on -one with French President Emmanuel Macron, President Moon asked for France's support in the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. Macron said his country is ready to provide everything it can for the stability of the region. Both also agreed on the French president's visit to Korea in the near future. The world leaders at G20 Osaka got a chance to formally greet one another, and there were a number of subtle clues on display regarding their ties with Japan. Our Kim mo now zooms in on those small details and unspoken hints that could symbolize each member state's relations with host nation Japan. Stark contrasts were on display at G20 Osaka, with some leaders greeting each other with a passionate hug and others with a frosty handshake. At the first official event of the summit, their body language drew a clear picture of their respective state of relations with host nation Japan. From around 11 a.m. local time, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe started greeting the 38 participants one by one. When it was South Korean President Moon Jae-in's turn, who was sixth in the order, Prime Minister Abe shook his hand tensely with a plain smile on his face. Ties between Seoul and Tokyo have been on ice in recent months over various disputes, including the issue of wartime compensation. Abe warmed up considerably when French President Emmanuel Macron came in, giving him a tight hug and pat on the back, a clear expression of intimacy. Each G20 nation's diplomatic standing with Japan was also hinted at the group photo session. Traditionally, leaders who serve the longest sit in the center of the first row near the leader of the host nation. The representative of the previous G20 host nation, as well as the one that's next in line, usually stands to the left and right of the host nation's leader. But this year's group photo has seemingly given an unusual level of precedence for U.S. President Donald Trump, who is positioned next to Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman from Saudi Arabia, which will host next year's G20 summit. This is a break from tradition, as President Trump's tenure in office is shorter than Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Indonesian President Joko Widodo. Though speculation is rife over the prominence of Trump in the photo op, pundits say it could reflect Japan's affinity for the American president and Abe's wish to forge closer ties with Washington. Kim mo Arirang News. Washington's nuclear envoy is in Seoul right now, ahead of President Donald Trump's meeting with his South Korean counterpart that is happening this weekend. And Stephen Began hint hinted on a change in tone on their denuclearization talks with the North. Our EG1 with the details. 
The U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Stephen Began, says the U.S. is ready to engage in talks with North Korea to implement the Singapore Agreement in a simultaneous and parallel way. This is according to Seoul's foreign ministry in its statement on the outcome of Began's meeting Friday morning with Seoul's Special Representative for Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs, Lee Do-hun. In their meeting, more than an hour long, the two reportedly exchanged views on the recent developments surrounding North Korea and discussed the denuclearization issues their leaders will address when they meet this weekend. Began reportedly said he hopes that the South Korea-U.S. summit will be an important event in terms of peace and prosperity on the Korean peninsula. A day earlier, a director general at North Korea's foreign ministry released a statement saying that talks can only resume if Washington first comes up with what it called a proper counterproposal. The official also expressed dissatisfaction with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, saying that negotiations should be conducted with a counterpart who has a good sense of communication. An expert says Began's openness to talks is the U.S. trying to be flexible and bring out the North to the table. This surely is a change in stance from the Hanoi summit when the U.S. sought a comprehensive agreement. This isn't exactly what the North asked for, though, to ease sanctions in exchange for dismantling the Yongbyon nuclear facility. So the core issue is still there, but the U.S. is saying that it is willing to be flexible in achieving the North's denuclearization and peace and establishing diplomatic ties, and so talks need to be resumed to narrow their differences. Began also met Friday afternoon with Seoul's Unification Minister Kim yeon chul who is expected to have updated Began on inter-Korean ties, including Seoul's plans to provide 50,000 tons of rice aid to the north. There's been speculation that Began might try to get in touch with the North Koreans at the border village of Panmunjom before President Trump arrives in Seoul on Saturday. But there's not much time left, so observers don't think that's a possibility any longer. Lee ji Arirang News. The South Korean government's plan to give 50,000 tons of rice as food assistance to North Korea has been approved by a South Korean committee promoting inter-Korean exchanges. The committee is comprised of government and civilian panels. 50,000 tons of rice will be delivered to the North via the World Food Programme to support over 2 million people across North Korea. The government will be spending 23.6 million US dollars to get the rice and 12 million dollars to help the WFP deliver and distribute it. The Unification Ministry says the WFP will be strengthening the monitoring process to ensure that the food aid is distributed transparently. During his upcoming trip to Korea, U.S. President Donald Trump is expected to meet with local businessmen, something he hasn't done in previous visits to the country. This comes amid new remarks by President Trump hinting at additional tariffs on imported goods to reduce U.S. trade deficits. Kim ji reports. On the second day of his visit to Korea this Sunday, U.S. President Donald Trump is scheduled to meet some 10 Korean businessmen, including the heads of the country's top five conglomerates, including Samsung, Hyundai Motor and SK. It'll mark the first time President Trump has set a meeting with Korean businessmen during his visit to the country. President Trump's expected to ask for an increase in investments to the U.S., similar to the requests he made when he met local businessmen during his visits to Japan and Britain. I think he's going to emphasize that the uh, current trade conflict as well as current difficulties will continue and that uh, other countries uh, should make an effort to lower their trade barriers and not subsidize or not explicitly promote their country's exports to the United States. According to the Korea Automobile Manufacturers Association, officials from the U.S. Trade Representative had paid a visit to Korea earlier this month, some two weeks ago, to gather opinions and consensus among local auto industry officials on the bilateral free trade agreement between the two countries. The U.S. has been considering imposing additional tariffs on national security grounds under Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, ahead of its announcement this upcoming coming November on whether to impose a maximum of 25 percent tariffs on imported automobiles.
The move is expected to result in a dramatic decrease in the shipment of automobiles and auto components to the U.S. by Korean exporters, which in turn is expected to have a profound impact on the Korean economy, which relies heavily on exports of automobiles and semiconductors for growth. Kim ji Arirang News. Turning to local politics now, and South Korea's National Assembly is getting back to work after a political showdown essentially shut it down for over 80 days. Rival parties held a plenary session today, voting on some important procedural matters, while the main opposition party has ended its boycott of parliamentary committee meetings. Kim Min-ji with more. It was a full House at the National Assembly's plenary session on Friday as rival parties voted to extend the terms of two special committees that expired this month. This was made possible by a deal reached earlier in the day by the three main parties. The committees are on political and judicial reform, and they've been given a mandate until the end of August, during which time they will deliberate key bills that were put on fast track, a move that sparked the parliamentary standoff that lasted more than 80 days. In April, despite strong objections from the main opposition Liberty Korea Party, the ruling Democratic Party and the minor opposition bloc fast-track key bills, including one electoral reform and establishing an independent body to probe high-level government officials. Friday's agreement gives the chairmanship of one of the committees to the ruling party, while the main opposition will chair the other. The parties acknowledge that the National Assembly is not completely normalized, but it's a first step. The people may think that we are very late, but I think it's fortunate that we can start things over. I believe it's an important step and the first step towards reaching a bigger deal. It took a lot to get this far. Rival parties had reached an agreement earlier this week, which the Liberty Korea Party later pulled out of. Amid mounting public criticism that they are neglecting their legislative duties, the main opposition party says it will also participate in standing committees, but other matters will need further negotiation. Although we're not completely operational yet, we have decided to return to Parliament. We have a lot to do in the June parliamentary session. We will take care of people's livelihood by participating in parliamentary meetings. The deal was generally welcomed by the smaller parties, but it was met with fierce criticism from the minor Progressive Justice Party, which had headed the Committee on Political Reform. They said the agreement does nothing more than replace their lawmaker and hands a position over to what they called extreme conservatives. While Parliament is running again, there are concerns of more attacks of war down the line, especially when rival parties get down to negotiating on the pending bills, as well as discussing the other agendas for the June session, such as reviewing the government's multi-billion dollar extra budget proposal. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. More gloomy news for South Korea's economy. Latest government figures show both industrial production and investment in the country dropped last month. Kim Hye-sung has the details. After two consecutive months of growth, South Korea's investment dropped sharply in May. Statistics Korea says capital investment slumped 8.2 percent on month due to falling investment in machinery, auto and transport equipment. Korean companies' capital investment is mainly in manufacturing, but sectors like semiconductors and steel are all performing poorly amid slowing economic growth. Investment may go up if uncertainties surrounding the U.S.-China trade spat are removed, and companies increase investment in new industries like AI and bio, but it's hard to say for now. Industrial output contracted 0.5 percent, also reversing two months of growth. Manufacturing production fell 1.5 percent. Statistic Korea says petrochemical goods production like NAFTA dropped 14 percent due to slowing domestic demand and falling exports on fears or competition from other Asian countries. The manufacturing inventory to shipment ratio recorded 118.5 percent in May, the highest figure in about two decades, meaning the rate of inventory accumulation is faster than that of shipments. The manufacturing production capacity index also fell due to the sluggish shipbuilding and auto sector, meaning overall manufacturing production is slowing down. Retail sales edged up by around 1 percent on month thanks to increased sales of clothing and electronic goods like air conditioners. The coincident index, which measures the current economic conditions in the business cycle, went up slightly for the first time in 14 months, but the leading economic index that shows future economic conditions fell, showing growing uncertainty over the domestic economy. Kim Hye-sung, 
Arirang News. The South Korean government has rolled out some new measures to reduce fine dust levels in the country. Our Choi Shiyoung zooms in on what they are. On Friday, at a meeting convened by the Special Committee on Fine Dust, Prime Minister Lee nak unveiled new measures that will strengthen punishment on those who violate fine dust regulations. Businesses that report false levels of fine dust emissions to the government will have their operations suspended. In addition, firms under contract to measure fine dust levels for those businesses will have their licenses revoked. If the businesses are found to have intentionally manipulated their fine dust readings, they will be punishable by a fine of up to 5% of their total revenues. The special committee introduced other measures as well. By the end of this year, the government plans to install air purifiers in all primary and secondary schools in the country. It will also replace old air purifiers in subway stations and install gauges that measure ultrafine dust levels at the stations and display them in real time. The government will also replace 139 ships owned by the state with more eco-friendly vessels. Private enterprises will receive financial assistance from the government if they build eco-friendly vessels. Starting next year, all diesel cars will be banned from entering the country's port when the government issues emergency fine dust reduction measures. Choi Shiyong, Arirang News. Thirty days have passed since a tourist boat carrying dozens of South Korean passengers sank in the Danube River in Budapest. While the search continues for two South Koreans who are still unaccounted for, one body recovered last week some 30 kilometers downstream from the accident site has been confirmed to be a South Korean woman in her 60s. Hungarian authorities made the announcement on Thursday based on DNA testing. The sinking has killed 24 South Koreans and two Hungarian crew members. U.S. Democrats are gearing up for the 2020 presidential election campaign with the first televised primary debates kicking off this week. And eyes are on whether or not their anti-Trump message will be enough to win over voters' hearts. Our Osu Young has more with a partial footage from NBC News. Beat Trump. Beat Trump. Beat Trump. All of us are united in defeating Trump. I will be the guy who beats Donald Trump. Donald Trump is alienating our allies, ripping away our health care. And it's just not working for the rest of America. 2020 is our chance to change that. As the Democratic Party's first primary debates kick off, many of the candidates have taken a stand against the incumbent Republican President Donald Trump. But will the anti-Trump agenda be enough to sway the voters? Is very clear. The mantra of their campaign is anti-Trump. Uh, and that's not a substantive uh, policy that I think the American people want to see. Probably one of the weaknesses of the Democrats right now is that they don't have a focused agenda on what the American people think is important. Key Democrat contenders have so far highlighted issues such as climate change and the expansion of social welfare, issues that have been neglected by the Republicans. So all the Democrats want to talk about climate change again and put it back on the agenda. And I think an expansion of Medicare is definitely in the works. The whole issue of health care was very popular in 2018. It helped the Democrats take the House of Representatives. And I think it's going to be very popular for the, and very helpful to the Democrats in 2020. However, it's clear the candidate has to be more than the run-of-the-mill textbook Democrat to win over voters in swing states. We cannot win with just the Democratic base voters. We need those uh, swing voters in uh, districts such as mine that where a lot of people have been laid off. And they may not like President Trump personally or like his behavior, but they also are not necessarily seeing anything with the Democrats. Observers say the candidates need to focus on the economy and set out how they can top the low unemployment figures and optimism seen during Trump's term. I think the difficulty here is if the economy is still going very well in the United States, then Trump has a great advantage on that, on that regard. And so the Democrats will have to sort of package their message in a way that deflects attention away from President Trump. Because even though unemployment is very low, uh, salaries uh, haven't quite kept up 
Uh, and so people are very interested in having uh, wages go up. While recent polls indicate Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren as the leading Democrat contenders, observers are not ruling out potential twists and turns throughout the dozen primary debates. Oh Seung, Arirang News. The summer vacation season is edging closer with many Koreans planning out their holidays. But as our Won Jung Hun explains, it seems many Koreans won't be traveling very far this year. Seven out of ten Koreans who plan to take summer vacation this year are considering traveling within the country. According to a survey of over 1,000 South Korean citizens by the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism and the Korea Tourism Organization, 48.2% of respondents said they are planning to take a summer vacation. Among those who plan to travel, nearly 70% said they prefer to travel within the country and some 20% opt for a trip abroad. For those who are planning a domestic trip, Gangwon-do province in the northeast of the country was the top destination with over 30 percent, followed by the southern resort island of Jeju with 17 percent, and the country's southern regions Gyeongsangnam-do and Jeollanam-do with some 13 percent and 10 percent, respectively. More than 25 percent of respondents planned to take their vacation in a week starting July 29th. The next most popular weeks were the first week of August and first week of July. Holiday makers planned to take 3.7 days of vacation on average and spend an average of 260,000 Korean won or just over 230 US dollars on their trip. Among some 40% of those who said they have no vacations plans, nearly 40% cited lack of time while some 25% mentioned economic reasons. Won Jung Won, Arirang News. The U.S. State Department says it's still ready to talk with North Korea. This is in response to the North Korean Foreign Ministry's recent statement demanding that Washington come up with what it sees as a proper counterproposal on denuclearization by the end of the year. The department also said the U.S. will continue to invite the North to nuclear and peace talks. Recent government data shows the number of deaths will surpass the number of births in most parts of South Korea by 2042. The data by Statistics Korea also shows that over the next 30 years, Korea's working age population, those aged between 15 and 65, will drop by 12 million. By 2047, people aged 65 or older are predicted to make up more than 35% of the population in most cities and provinces. BTS's recent tour has become the highest grossing one of May this year. According to Billboard Box Score, the Korean boy band managed to rake in nearly 52 million US dollars from only eight shows in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles and Sao Paulo. Metallica ranked second, but by quite a margin, only recording half the sales of BTS. Outdoor swimming pools along Seoul's Hangang Park are now open. Visitors can also enjoy other activities such as survival games, a bubble dance festival and safety training. The pools are open from 9am to 7pm until August 25th. That has been your 3-Minute News Flash. It was a hot and sticky day here in Seoul today, quite uncomfortable to be outside. That's right, the high humidity is expected to continue as the monsoon rain returns this weekend. Let's get more details from our Michelle Park at the Weather Centre. Michelle. Hi guys, the monsoon rain is on its way again. It will start from Jeju and Jeollanam, the province, in the early morning hours and will spread across the entire country by noon tomorrow. 
And then again, the heaviest rain will fall on Jeju and the southern regions. Now be careful near the mountainous regions of Jeju for possible landslides as more than 300 millimeters of rain is expected to fall. While Jeollado and Gyeongsangdo provinces will also see a huge amount of rain this weekend with up to 200 millimeters in the forecast. And compared to the south, the capital is expecting lighter rain of between 5 and 20 millimeters throughout Saturday. Now the rain will wake up similar temperatures as it did today, so we're beginning at 20 degrees Celsius and similar readings seen across the whole country. The rainy skies will keep the mercury lower, so we're topping out to 27 degrees, while Busan is a lot cooler at 24, higher for Jeju at 28 degrees. Thankfully, around the capital area, the rain is expected to taper off on Sunday, the day of the South Korea-US summit, so the weather won't be a big problem for President Trump's visit. Now, after this rain, we will mostly likely to return of the sweltering heat again. Now, I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thank you as always for watching. News in Depth is next.